I'd like to discuss what it is. Then I'd like to discuss the different viewpoints and approaches to the study of biological psychology. I was hoping to also discuss the topics of neuroplasticity and reductionism as well. Biological psychology makes a vital contribution to, to our understanding of neurology, psychiatry, and other medical fields. Um, animals make a major contribution to our understanding of these issues. And I'd like to also talk about the history of biological psychology, which dates back to antiquity. Biological psychology is also referred to as physiological psychology or behavioral neuroscience. And it's defined as the application of the principles of biology to the study of physiological, genetic, and developmental mechanisms of behavior in humans and other animals. Numerous fields fall under this umbrella. In fact, more than we can adequately address in this course. So neuroradiologists, neurologists, psychiatrists, clinical psychologists, uh, researchers on artificial intelligence, cognitive neuroscience, uh, paleontologists, primatologists. There are so many different areas that fall under this, this broad umbrella uh, we're going to refer to as biology. We need to look at this topic from various viewpoints because each viewpoint is limited. And we choose the viewpoint that is the most relevant to the questions that, that we want to ask. Um, in order to demonstrate this, I, I like the example of the five blind men who are trying to discover the nature of an elephant. And one is feeling the trunk. Another's feeling the ears. Another's feeling the body of the elephant. Um, each of them is going to have a much different description of the physical attributes of the elephant than the one who's feeling the tail. So depending on your viewpoint, things are going to look different. However, if we can take all of these complementary, not mutually exclusive, but complementary um, perspectives when trying to understand biological psychology, we're going to have a more comprehensive, complete, and useful understanding of our field. So these five viewpoints we're going to discuss are describing behavior, studying the evolution of behavior, exploring development as it relates to behavior. Number four is looking at the mechanisms of behavior. And finally, number five is going to be looking at ways to apply what we've learned to human beings. So I'm going to start with describing behavior. That's our first viewpoint. Behavior can be described in terms of acts or processes or in terms of structure or functions. For example, an arm movement can be described according to the muscles that contract. We could also describe an arm movement by what the arm is being used for. For instance, we can use our arm to hold a ball, to throw a ball, to roll a ball, Sometimes we want to understand what is the purpose of what we're doing when we throw a ball. Now, just because we're throwing a ball doesn't mean that a certain set of muscles are going to be used. For instance, depending on whether I'm throwing a baseball or a softball, I can use entirely different muscles to throw that ball. I can be pitching a ball but using my bicep instead of my tricep in order to throw the ball, depending on whether it's more overhand or underhand. The second viewpoint of biological psychology is studying the evolution of behavior. 
species can be compared to study evolution of brain and behavior. We do this in many ways. We're going to talk in great depth about voles and the hippocampal size. We're going to talk about certain birds with enlarged frontal lobes. We're also going to talk about serotonin levels. Now, continuity of behavior and biological processes um, because of um, common ancestry is, is, is a common thing. Uh, but differences in behavior and biology that have evolved as adaptations, which is a trait that's passed on from a com common ancestor, is, is described as being conserved. Overall, biology can be rather conservative. The motto of biology is oftentimes, if it's not broken, you don't fix it. For instance, we have a neurotransmitter that is a... Um, a biogenic amine uh, that we call serotonin. And this neurotransmitter is related to mood and neurosis and feelings of social inadequacy in human beings. Interestingly, whenever a lobster is in a conflict, when it battles for turf or whatever lobsters battle for, if it loses the conflict, it actually has a reduction in serotonin levels. This is consistent with a finding we're going to discuss in a little bit about how vervet monkeys also can be rated um, by serotonin levels. We can, we can actually use serotonin levels in order to gauge their social dominance or where they stand in a hierarchy. Again, Serotonin levels correlate positively with social status. In human beings, we find a similar um, pattern. In human beings, we studied uh, members of fraternities, uh, the people at the top of the hierarchy, the members uh, like the president and the vice president, they have higher serotonin levels than the pledges. So, um, although serotonin levels um, are involved in, in um, social status in lobsters, uh, they're not limited to lobsters. It also applies to mammals and human beings. So, serotonin has been conserved. We can also observe the development of behavior over the lifespan. Ontogeny is the process of growing up and growing old. And behaviors that change over the lifespan are studied to learn about functions and mechanisms. We're going to discuss this in this class. We're going to talk about how the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed and fully myelinated until the age of 26. And how does this influence behavior policies? How does this influence our understanding of the role of the prefrontal cortex? The fourth viewpoint is studying the biological mechanisms involved in a behavior. We're going to talk about specifically which neurotransmitters, which brain mechanisms, how it happens. We'll discuss this a great deal. And then finally, our fifth viewpoint is going to be the study of the applications of biological psychology. Um, as in, for instance, behavioral dysfunction. Research can be applied to humans, especially in diseases of the brain. Um, up on the right, you can see this, this Batman shield that was placed over a boy's medication. Research found that if children who were being treated for um, cancer were given a comic book in which the superhero was experiencing the same symptoms that they were battling with. And then they were given a shield, which was placed over their medication, and told that this medication actually is the same stuff that the superhero was using. And they, they got some of that same medication. It had a dramatic effect on their prognosis, a favorable effect. It would help them they were more successful in dealing with their symptoms and recovering. So 
This is a beautiful application of biological psychology uh, to helping children who are battling illness. Now we have three approaches to studying biological psychology. As you've learned a thousand times in your Psych 101 class, experimental research is research in which an independent variable is manipulated and a dependent variable is measured in order to explore the strength and relationship between the independent and dependent variable. And you've heard this over and over again, that, the, that psychology is not what you think psychology is. Psychology is really about measuring dependent variables as you manipulate independent variables. Um, so experimental research in the field of biological psychology can be described as somatic or behavioral. A behavioral intervention is an intervention in which behavior is altered to see how the brain is affected. So the independent variable, is which is the factor being manipulated, is going to be behavior. And the dependent variable that we're going to measure will be the brain. Um, an example of this would be um, eliminating a primate's social status and then measuring changes in its brain. And sure enough, we actually have done this. There's a really fascinating study that was done by Raleigh, McGuire, Brammer, and Uweiler. Um, they were observing a group of vervet monkeys. And you can see our cute little vervet monkey there down in the lower left-hand corner. Um, as cute as they are, they have a pretty rugged social hierarchy. There's the alpha male, there's the beta, um, all the way down to the most subordinate but they have this really strict hierarchy and um, they observed the vervet monkeys and, and, and basically monitored and recorded their behavior. And you find the behavior of a dominant vervet monkey is different than that of a um, subordinate one. When a dominant vervet monkey is in its habitat, females often make passes at them uh, while males offer up food, sometimes they get off of the rock they were sitting on in case the alpha male wants to sit on it. They're constantly being acknowledged. Now, if you're at the bottom of the hier hierarchy, it's much different. Um, you could be mistreated for not offering to share your food with the, with the um, dominant male in the group. Females are much less likely to show interest in you, and nobody's going to get off of their rock in order to offer, offer their seat to you. So this is what life is like if you're a vervet monkey. And one night when the alpha male was asleep, they were actually put into an office. It was actually an observation room, I believe, where they were allowed to watch the other vervet monkeys but the other vervet monkeys could not see him. So when he awoke, he saw females blowing him off. He saw other males sitting on rocks in front of him, eating food, not even offering any to him. He felt completely ghosted. He was getting ignored. No one was offering to share. It was a lot different than the experience of being out in the general population with your vervet. He would engage in displays of anger, he was not happy. Um, and then when they measured his serotonin levels, lo and behold, they had dropped dramatically. He now has the, the lowest serotonin levels in the whole tribe. Everyone else, now that he's absent, every other vervet monkey's serotonin levels go up one notch. So, so we see that Serotonin levels posit positively correlate with social status. Okay, this is vervet monkeys, though. Does, does this apply to human beings? Human beings are much more complex, right? There actually has been research. Um, this research, of course, was done on college students, as it often is. Uh, in this particular research, they found that in the Greek system, in fraternities, the president 
typically has the highest levels of serotonin. The pledges have lower, and you can approximate individual members' serotonin levels by looking at their status on the fraternal. So it looks like this generalizes to humans as well as lobsters. Now that we've talked about behavioral approaches, let's talk about somatic interventions. A somatic intervention is an intervention in the brain is altered to see how behavior is affected. So the independent variables, the variable being manipulated, which is the brain, the dependent variable, which, which is measured, is behavior. So a great example of this would be research in which oxytocin, this is not oxycontin, this is not the, um, the narcotic oxycontin, this is actually a hormone, oxytocin, um, it will be injected into a rat's brain. And the dependent variable is to measure the strength and frequency of maternal behaviors. And according to Robert Sapolsky's research in, two, in 2017, um, when you infuse oxytocin into the brain of a virgin rat, she'll act maternally, retrieving, grooming, li and licking pups block the actions of oxytocin in a rodent mother, and she'll stop maternal behaviors, including nursing. So, clearly biology influence. Now, the third approach, the final approach we're going to talk about is correlational research. Correlation me measures how much about a body measure varies with a behavioral measure, but correlation does not imply causation. For instance, we could look at how testosterone levels correlate with aggressive behavior without actually manipulating the variable. When testosterone levels go up, one is more likely to engage in some aggressive behaviors. Um, However, when somebody wins a confrontation, their testosterone levels go up. So it's not a unidirectional relationship. Now, I want to offer a caveat. Correlation does not imply causation. What I mean by that is, when I was at a conference about seven years ago, they were talking about lifestyle variables um, as they relate to your likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease. And it was really interesting because most behavioral lifestyle, var lifestyle variables didn't correlate very strongly with developing Alzheimer's. However, there was a relatively strong negative correlation between developing Alzheimer's and being a chain smoker for most of your life. Um, some of the people attending the, the um, seminar got excited and they accosted the lecturer before the lecture began, all excited. And the lecturer had to ask them to sit down. And she spoke into her microphone and said, I, I want to point something out for everyone. You probably see that there's a strong negative correlation between Alzheimer's disease and cigarette smoking. That doesn't mean that cigarettes are staving off Alzheimer's or preventing it. That just simply means that because of other variables, such as health issues related to cigarette smoking, your likelihood of being diagnosed with, skip, with uh, Alzheimer's um, In biological psychology, we're forced to rely on all three of these approaches to study the relationship between the brain and behavior. Historically, what we know about the brain has been derived from the study of three major areas. First, brain injuries. Individuals with brain injuries, such as Phineas Gage, who we'll talk about, who was a foreman with the railroad company. We also look at brain lesions. We actually will lesion um, animals typically in an attempt to recreate the brain injuries that led to the syndromes of interest. 
And finally, we have brain imaging. Now, brain imaging is newer. The availability of brain imaging was quite limited uh, 100 years ago. Therefore, there is not really uh, as much research on it. Um, but we'll talk about the vital role that it plays in studying um, biological psychology. Now, neuroplasticity describes the ability of the brain to change or be changed by environment in experience. Um, and this can occur during development as well as in adulthood. Um, the dendritic spines of the brain can change shape in seconds. And down below on the left, you actually have a neuron. We're going to talk about this in great detail when we get to uh, chapter 2, our next chapter. Um, it, it's a neuron. It's a, it's a, it's a cell that actually can send a signal. And this is a really special power that it has. It really allows it to play a key role in what it is to be a human being. It allows us to think, to reason, to perceive. Um, we're going to talk about it in great deal. Now, in humans, psychological expectations, such as anticipated pain, can affect the magnitude of a physiological response for the better or worse. When I was young, I remember having a blood draw and it was a, a really bad experience. I'm surprised I haven't repressed it. All I remember is the person trying to draw the blood kept saying, okay, I'm going to get it this time. And then complaining about, oh, you've got really small veins, your blood vessels are not really, yeah. Um, it was a really horrible experience. I think I even got a scar afterward. Um, um, decades later, I went in to get some shots, and uh, the nurse noted that I, I looked a little nervous, and I commended her for her astute observation and said, I am very nervous. I've never been a fan of needles. And she said, that's nothing to worry about. Actually, we got this new batch of needles that are so thin, you can't even feel them. They're so, they're so tiny, they go in the pores in your skin, and they don't actually touch nerves. And I said, wow, does my insurance cover those? She said, well, yeah, it'll cover those. You just have to have really thin skin, because these needles are so tiny, they'll break if you don't have thin skin. She said, here. Let me feel your skin. And she somehow distracted me, ended up looking at the wall or looking at something she handed at me. And I felt her feel my skin. It wasn't painful at all. Looked, and I said, hey, so is my skin thin enough? She says, doesn't matter. You already got the shot. I was stunned. I just didn't understand what had just happened. She said, oh, it's an old trick I learned at school. So whenever I was getting my shot, my brain probably initially looked like the brain over on the right. If I would have received that shot, it would have hurt very bad. That's the anterior cingulate. And as you can see, all that red and orange and white, that signifies areas of high glucose metabolism. Um, that's an area that's involved in the anticipation as well as experience of pain. I'm assuming after her intervention, when I received the shot, my brain was more like the brain over on the left. So behavior can change the way that the brain perceives something as basic and fundamental as pain. It's helpful to look at biological psychology from several levels. Reductionism breaks a system down into its smaller parts in order to understand it. We call these the seven levels of analysis. The molecular, which we're going to discuss in chapter three, deals with channels and pumps that are in the skin of the neuron. We call it the neuronal membrane. 
just the membrane here. It's a bilipid layer. And here we have a channel. It's like a little gate that allows molecules to go through. The synaptic level, and here we have a synapse. Um, on the left side, we have the presynaptic neuron. And on the right, we have the postsynaptic neuron. Postsynaptic comes after the synapse. Neurotransmitters are released from this presynaptic neuron into the synapse, where they diffuse across, and they hit receptors on the postsynaptic. We're going to talk about this in great deal in Chapter 4. We also have the cellular level of reductionism. Uh, this is a cell, again, called a neuron. A neuron carries an action potential. Um, it gives it the ability to communicate. But we're going to talk about this next chapter, Chapter 2. We're going to also talk about circuits throughout the later chapters of the book. For instance, uh, this is the limbic system here. It's a circuit. It's been referred to as the circuit of papes at one point. But the limbic system is very important for homeostasis, olfaction, memory, and emotion. And we're going to talk about it in great deal. We're going to have a whole chapter that's going to be on that. Um, Hal Blumenfeld of Yale has used the acronym HOME to remember the functions of the limbic system. And, and we'll uh, revisit this idea that homeostasis, olfaction, memory, and emotion are the key roles, the primary roles of the limbic system. We're also going to look at brain regions. The structure right here uh, down below, this is what we call the thalamus. The thalamus is a switchboard that directs incoming information that we perceive to the appropriate part of the cortex. This is a daunting task. People don't usually realize this, but the visual qualities of what we perceive actually get directed to the visual cortex, whereas the auditory go to the auditory cortex. The somatosensory features go to the somatosensory cortex. So um, it's kind of fascinating how whenever we conjure up the memory of a person, uh, all of those features come together seamlessly. We're going to also talk about organs. This right here is the brain, of course. We're going to talk about the pieces, the parts, how it works. And then finally, the last level of reduction will be the social level. It has to do with human behavior, social order, social rules, expectations, we're going to talk about emotions. We're going to talk about stress. Um, we got two children eating some ice cream. What are the pragmatics? What are the rules around eating ice cream if you're five years old? Well, there's only one rule. Eat it fast. Um, this is from some research that was done on um, PET scans and in individuals who are either hearing words passively, seeing them passively, reading them, or generating words from a particular category. So up here we can see the red area is the area where the most glucose is being utilized. So we can see these other areas are in first gear, but this area is in fifth gear. Um, this is the auditory cortex. It's pretty active when we're passively hearing words. So if you're in a lecture and you're not understanding anything you're hearing and you've already given up on trying to hear, trying to understand what you're hearing, that's probably where the activity is going on. If you're looking at a PowerPoint but not really understanding it, not really fully awake here, just kind of staring at the PowerPoint, well, here in the occipital cortex, the visual cortex, um, you're probably going to be having your highest area of activity. Now, if you're reading words, part of the motor cortex as well as part of the um, sensory cortex correlate with the face. Those are going to be involved. And then finally, if you're generating words, this area of the frontal cortex, which is next to what we would call Broca's area, it's really active when we're generating words. I think in this particular case, um, patients were asked to generate words that belong to a particular category. But there are also other uh, ways that people are asked to generate words. 
for instance, you can ask somebody to generate words that begin with a certain letter. We call this uh, gauging somebody's uh, verbal fluency. Now, biological psychology can help to understand brain disorders and develop treatments. One in five Americans suffers from a neurological or psychiatric disorder. So, a substantial portion of the population is dealing with the symptoms that we're going to investigate and try to better understand. Now, clinical and laboratory approaches are both important in, in this research. We're going to have a chapter that is about psychiatric disorders. We're going to talk about major depressive disorder and anxiety, which are two of the most common disorders, especially for females. For males, it seems like alcohol abuse tends to be um, the most common drug and alcohol abuse. I've seen this working in clinics in Northern California. I've seen that in the Napa area. Alcoholism is, is a, a condition that you don't have to go far to witness. Um, we're also going to talk about neurological disorders. As you can see, the two most common neurological disorders there would be Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Sometimes the two occur together. Um, other conditions such as migraines are also common, traumatic brain injury epilepsy, movement disorders such as Parkinson's and Huntington disease. We're going to talk about these as well as developmental disabilities and um, their prevalence and uh, the biological mechanisms that seem implemented into these conditions. Here we have two coronal um, MRIs of individuals uh, with, um, with or without schizophrenia. So on the left, you have an individual with schizophrenia. On the left, an individual without. And what I want you to note is right here, these two black holes here, these are actually ventricles. These are the lateral ventricles. And they're relatively pronounced in the individual with schizophrenia. Now, if we do a brain scan of the individual who does not have schizophrenia, we find that those lateral ventricles are much smaller. Well, what are the lateral ventricles? The lateral ventricles are actually cavities that are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. These ones are much larger than those ones. The reason that the ventricles are larger in individuals with schizophrenia is because that individual has atrophy in their brain. And we're going to talk about when this atrophy occurs, how it might occur, and what parts of the brain it actually occurs in for those individuals who develop schizophrenia. We're going to also talk about the fact that when an individual has schizophrenia, oftentimes they have cognitive deficits that go with the atrophy and brain dysfunction uh, that they commonly experience. Now, the study of biological bases of behavior requires research on other species, and most people believe animal research is justified, yet some opponents believe it's unethical no matter how much benefit is gained. Um, there are cases of vandalism, arson, death threats, um, on researchers who use animals to, to do research. Now we're going to talk about the history of biological psychology. So we have evidence that before written history, instruments called trephines were used to bore holes through the skull, um, suggesting that individuals before written history knew there was something special about the brain Unfortunately, we don't know whether they were trying to um, remove spirits from the skull or whether they were trying to relieve compression, which is a practice we still do today when we perform craniotomies. Now, early Egyptians and Greeks 
including Aristotle, believed the heart was the seat of mental capacities. However, the Edwin Smith papyrus documented 48 cases of brain injury with descriptions of the behavioral sequelae that accompanied the brain injuries. Well, Aristotle believed the brain was akin to a radiator that cools the body down. Hippocrates wrote of the brain as the seat of thoughts and emotions, and he even noted that brain damage leads to contralateral behavioral sequelae. Herophilus conducted early dissections, tracing the nervous system, and Galen noted behavioral changes in brain-injured gladiators. Galen and Augustine postulated the ventricles of the brain were responsible for the mental functions. So we saw those ventricles a moment ago when we were looking at the, the brain scans of the individual with schizophrenia and without. So they thought that those, those little cavities were actually where there were gases that were held that were responsible for mental functions. Now the Renaissance scientist Leonardo da Vinci pioneered anatomical drawings, including the use of cross-sections, an anatomist emphasized the external surfaces of the brain. Artists recognizing the complexity of the brain believed it was God's gift to mankind. And uh, Michelangelo, who painted God on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the way that he painted God, it looks reminiscent to many of a mid-sagittal diagram of the human brain. Now, if you know anything about Michelangelo, you know that he was very good at getting the last word in, and he didn't have a whole lot of fear about letting his thoughts be known. Um, many feel that this picture that he has right here of, this is the creation of Adam, that God here looks a lot like a mid-sagittal section of a brain. Here we have what we would call the cerebellum. Here we have the cerebral cortex. That certainly does look like a cerebral cortex. You could even say maybe that looks like a temporal lobe there. This looks a bit like a, a brain stem. So leave that decision up to you. What do you think he was trying to say? Does God exist in the brain? Is that what he's saying? Dualism is the idea put forth by Rene Descartes that humans have a non-material soul as well as a material body. Dualism was one of the most innovative ideas of its century. Um, it was the idea that we have a mind and a body. Rene Descartes went into great detail. He thought a great deal about how you could prove this. Um, you probably are familiar with Descartes from his Cogito Ergo Sum, I Think Therefore I Am. Um, he also came up with this idea that we have this soul which is made of a different substance, this mind, as the brain itself. And he, when he elaborated, he pointed out the differences. There are fundamental differences between your mind and your brain. For instance, how many pieces can you cut a brain into? Well, it depends. Can you freeze it? If you have the right equipment, you could potentially cut it into 100,000 pieces, right? What about the soul, the experience of perception, the experience of existence, the feeling of being alive, the feeling of being me? How many consciousnesses can you have? How many pieces can you divide consciousness into? Well, you can't really divide it. How can you be conscious twice at the same time simultaneously? It seems like it's uh, 
it's a unitary, it's, uh, there's a oneness to it. So he argued that the non-material soul, which he called the Rei Cogitans, is an entirely different substance than the material body, the Rei Extensia. Now, appear, fearing opposition from the church, he withheld publication um, of his book until 1662 after his death. He proposed the concept of spinal reflexes in the neural pathways. Um, he also went as far as to um, try to explain where the soul, uh, the Rei Cogitans, the mind, where it's located. And he felt it was the pineal gland. The pineal gland is this little tiny gland that's actually behind the brain stem. And it's, and there's only one. You don't have two of them. Many of the the or the uh, structures in the brain you have two of, but this one you only have one. It's singular. As a result, he felt that that's where the Rei Cogitans was located and that it was the junction between the mind and the body. Still to this day, we call this the inter interactionist dilemma, the idea that we still don't know how would a material body and an immaterial mind, how would they actually influence each other? In the 19th century, phrenology assigned separate functions to specific cortical areas. This is uh, something we're going to call localization of function. Um, the bumps of the skull were thought to overlie enlarged brain regions, which were then matched to behaviors. Um, in this time, Individuals would actually go to a phrenologist who would then feel their skull and note any um, protuberances, any, any areas where it was thicker than other areas, and they would actually make recommendations such as, hey, it looks like uh, your uh, creativity area is actually a little bit plumper, and um, but it's looking like your area for problem solving isn't quite as good as it could be. So maybe you should consider like once your art classes um, finally are done, maybe you consider maybe doing some some reading mysteries or playing Sudoku or whatever. I, I don't know exactly what they recommend, but people did report benefit that they felt that it was useful to see a phrenologist and follow through with their recommendations. Um, down below we actually have a phrenologist model of the, the head, um, which shows the different areas that they were looking at. Um, now, Paul Broca demonstrated that language ability is restricted to a small area based on a patient with uh, damage in that region. The patient was named Tan. Well, they know him as Tan because Tan was the only syllable he was able to utter after he had damage um, to uh, the left frontal lobe uh, in an area that we now refer to as Broca's area, which is very important for the production of speech. Later, Carl Wernicke noted that the left posterior area of the brain is responsible for understanding language, so language comprehension. So these are examples of localization of function. And this research idea continues um, to find differences in brain regions and relate behaviors to those regions. Norman Geshwin demonstrated that cognitive functions like, like dyslexia can be induced by disruption of connections between locations. You're probably familiar with this, right? If you uh, work in IT, maybe you're working customer service at, at an electronics store, Every once in a while, somebody calls in to say that their monitor doesn't work. There's something wrong with it. They raise concern about how good the product is. And after a thorough investigation, you discover that it was not plugged into an electric outlet. So the monitor is not working, but it's not because the monitor's broke. It's the connection to the electric outlet that's been disrupted. The brain is similar in some regards. There are certain connection pathways we're going to talk about, like the arcuate fasciculus. We're going to talk about 
um, the supermarginal gyrus. Um, but Norman Geschwin demonstrated cognitive functions like dyslexia can be induced by disruption of connections between these locations. And this idea continues on. And these syndromes are referred to as disconnection syndromes. The most contemporary neuroscientists of our time include individuals like Oliver Sacks and Antonio Damasio. Oliver Sacks was a neurologist who wrote about the patients he's treated. He's, he's written many books. Um, he even has a movie written about a uh, condition that he treated. Um, he's written books like An Anthropologist on Mars. Um, really fascinating reads all about real patients. Now, Antonio Damasio uh, frequently publishes on emotions and philosophical issues in neuroscience. We're going to see some of his research over the course of our chapter, especially in the chapter on emotions. Biological psychology arose in the 20th century, and important studies were conducted on learning and memory, conditioning, perception, as well as motivation. Uh, for instance, we're going to talk about Donald Hebb, who described neuronal connections such as cell assemblies and Hebbian synapses. Uh, he's the one who came up with the adage, cells that fire together wire together, something that we have since uh, demonstrated. Um, but most scientists agree that consciousness, the state of awareness of one's own existence and experience, is important and is connected to brain activity. However, some brain activity is unconscious. The deep parts of our brain are important for arousal, where the topmost parts of the brain are responsible for our current experience. So we're going to talk about what these different areas of the brain are important for. Uh, we're going to talk about how we actually do have four lobes. The four lobes of the brain are going to be the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and the occipital lobe. And this idea of localization of function still carries on. We're going to discuss how we've learned from patients, and we've learned um, that this part of the prefrontal cortex called the orbital gyrus, is really, really important for impulse control. This part of the prefrontal cortex, right here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is really important for planning, abstract reason, problem solving, um, and multitasking. This area of the frontal lobe in here is really important for controlling our muscles in our body moving. This area right here is really important for planning out our movements. This area right here is really important for feeling, for somatosensory processing. This area right here is a really important part of the auditory cortex. The occipital lobe right here, is super important for processing visual information. In fact, we have two streams. The bottom one is important for identifying what something is, whereas the top is important for identifying where it is. Down at the bottom of the temporal lobe, we have something we're going to refer to as the fusiform face area that's really important for identifying faces, which, by the way, Humans are very good at recognizing faces. You probably know from listening to a relative say, oh, that actor right there, that is, and they can identify an actor who hasn't been in a movie for decades. 
they can actually identify the face, even though it's aged for many decades, sometimes it looks entirely different. So these ideas, uh, um, such as localization, they carry on in research as well as in clinical practice. And we're going to explore these ideas so that we can understand them and try to use them.